Good morning. Oh, come on, Waco ISD. Good morning. How are y'all? This is the start of a brand new school year. How are y'all? You look great. She said, my name is Patrick Briggs. I have the privilege and honor of being your avid Texas State Director, which means my entire job is to support about 1,000 schools just in the state of Texas that have the avid college readiness system. Follow me on Twitter. I am tweeting some great stuff. Feel free to live tweet during the session. Is there free Wi-Fi here? Let's move on. So without any further ado, I had the privilege and honor of addressing most of you last year. How many of you were here last year when Region 12 did the convocation? Wow, it looks like we have quite a bit new staff, or some of us couldn't make it last year. Now, I am pushing the button. There we go. All righty. So here is our essential question. And I love essential questions because they changed my life as a teacher. I can remember when I was that 21-year-old teacher, had my college degree from Prairie View A&M University. Who you rooting for? Ow! Uh, who you rooting for? Y'all went to Prairie View! Had that college degree from Prairie View A&M University. Had my teaching certificate from the state of Texas that expires at life. <laughs> How many of you have your lifetime teaching certificate? Uh-huh. I'm looking over here. Y'all didn't even know those existed, did you? <laughs> Yeah, my principal certificate is life. You couldn't tell me anything. So I walked into a classroom of 12-year-old people and let them know how lucky they were to have me. <laughs> they don't just pass out those pieces of paper, college degree, lifetime teaching certificate. I must be good. That was me. I was a hot mess at 21 years old. <laughs> and I can remember I put my objective on the board. Do you put your objective on the board? For whom is that? Oh, let me, let me go back to my first language. Who's that for? Because <laughs> I would ask a 12-year-old person, okay, the objective on the board says the students will be able to distinguish among photosynthesis and cellular respiration. Then I'd look at a 12-year-old and say, okay, so what are we supposed to do today? And they say, I don't know, you write that up there every day. <laughs> and I realized it didn't have anything to do with students learning. It was about me being compliant. <laughs> so I went to an essential question. Now, wait a minute, let me, let me, let me stop here. <laughs> I need you to keep your job. <laughs> so if the directive is to have an objective on the board, I need you to get paid every month. <laughs> Write that objective on the board. But what I added to that was an essential question. So for my students, what should you know and be able to do when you leave here? That would be ours. So our essential question is how can I Talking about y'all. How can I ensure innovation and excellence in education to prepare all learners? Now, from where did I get that essential question? And it's quiet. That would happen to be your mission statement. Oh, some of y'all like, really? Yeah. yeah. This is what you advertise to the world is the reason why you exist, the reason why these lights are on and people pay taxes. That is your purpose, straight from your website, your mission, and I love it. And y'all don't know, woo, I just got happy and went to shouting when I saw y'all's mission. That mission says, all learners. That means 99 and a half won't do, right? Come on, Waco, 99 and a half won't do. Y'all know I'm from the Black Baptist Church. I need a little call and response this morning. 99 and a half won't do. Ain't that right, Waco? All right. Now, all learners. So I got excited when I read that. Because, because let me take you back. When I was that 21-year-old teacher, you see the teacher in the picture up there, how, how happy and smiling he is. Those children in the picture, look at these children over here, happy, smiling, grinning. I'm going to keep it real. I looked like that man the very first day of school as that first-year teacher and not again until the last day. <laughs> but the 178 days in between, that wasn't me! How did I get there? How did I get from wanting to change the world on fire about doing great things for these children to by Thanksgiving, 
There were a couple of them I didn't like. And about 20 of them who hated me. Shame on me. But how did I get there? Well, I know now that I'm approaching 50, and I know what you're thinking. He can't possibly be almost 50. Cocoa butter. Some of y'all caught that. We'll talk about that later. But I went into that classroom full of children, letting them know how lucky they were to have me, and I defaulted to what was comfortable for me. I defaulted to my learning style, and I began to teach little bitty Patricks. If you weren't a little bitty Patrick, you didn't do well. <laughs> but of course, I was in the teacher's lounge talking about you. These kids can't learn, they are hot mess. Shame on me. Because one of the things I did was I gave my kids notes. I would spend weeks and then give them a test in science. <laughs> and I told these children, all of you are going to make a 100 on my test because I made the test straight from the notes. Guess how many 100s I had on that first test? Zero! I even had kids fail that first test. So of course, because I knew it all, I blamed children. <laughs> And what I realized is, I spent weeks teaching them how to copy. It was a course I was teaching, how do you copy? And then I was mad at them when they couldn't perform on a science assessment. Shame on me, there was no alignment there. We as teachers were the most powerful people on this planet because we control a variable. Between what we're supposed to teach and how we know if they've learned it is a variable called instruction. And what we choose to do but these great students for 180 days starts to control the trajectory of the rest of their life. And I didn't understand relationships either. Relationships. I remember that first year, I had that seasoned teacher come in and tell me, don't smile before Christmas. Huh, Dr. Phil asked my favorite question, Patrick, how did that work for you? And it didn't because I didn't have what we call relational capacity. It doesn't matter what study you look at. If I want to increase test scores, if I want to increase how students feel, if I want to increase what they understand, if I want to increase the meaningfulness, single biggest factor is relationships. Think about it. All of y'all, great teachers, have taught a kid who would do anything in the world for you. Great kid, never causes any problems. And that same kid goes to third period and acts like a fool. Let's keep it real. Does that child change and flip out in a five-minute passing period? No! What changes is the relationship between that kid and the significant adult in the other room. And I can remember going and checking on my kids once I became a better teacher in that in-school suspension room and said, what are you doing in here? You're one of my best kids. I, I never have any problems from you. And the kid would look up at me and say, Mr. Briggs, I can't stand her. She races, huh? Like, whoa! I've never seen that kid. And what I realized is I wasn't special. I chose to invest in something called relational capacity. What can I do to, with, and for you solely based on our relationship? Quick experiment. You all left home this morning, right? Okay, I told y'all where I was from. Y'all left home this morning, right? All right. What if when you left home, somebody, somebody stopped you, whoever lives with you, stopped you and said, oh, you going to that convocation. I just want you to know I love you so much. And then that person added, you are just so beautiful to me. And then they finished up with, and you know, I can't wait for you to get home today because I'm going to have a special surprise for you. Would y'all have liked that? Yay! Well, wait a minute. Let's see if relationships matter. What if when you came in here this morning, I stopped you, and I said, oh, you going to that convocation, huh? I just want you to know I love you so much. You know, you are the most beautiful person on this planet to me, and I can't wait for you to get home tonight. Because I'm going to have a special surprise for you. Would y'all have liked that? No! Somebody over there say yeah. <laughs> Wait a minute. 
The person at home and I have said the same thing, same words, same sentences, same voice tone, same inflection. Why y'all treating me differently? Where I come from, they say, because I don't know you. We don't have something called relational capacity. What can I do to, with, and for you solely based on our relationship? And I learned early on as that second year teacher when I became much better that I needed to invest in relational capacity because no kid cares how much you know until they know how much you care. That relational capacity piece. Not one rule we make. Some of you got your posters already made. No gun, no cell phone. Well, I'm excited to be in that room. I don't have a problem with rules, but just know that not one rule you make is gonna cause good behavior and grades and choices in May. Every strong relationship you make will. So my mission, you saw your mission, why do I get out of bed every day? That's mine. To close what we call the achievement gap by making sure all kids are college ready. I want every single child that we have the privilege and honor to see next week I want them to be college and career ready because we'll start to see what that does for their opportunities. Because you see that word achievement gap up there? I don't believe there's such a thing. There is no achievement gap. I can give you 50 reasons why statistically I should be dead or in prison. Statistically, I had a better chance at both. So where's my achievement gap? I want it. It was promised to me. You see, it doesn't exist. Because I had great educators like you who closed the two real gaps we have in this country. The first gap, we have an opportunity gap. Who has the opportunity to learn at those high levels to be made college and career ready? Not y'all. Let me tell you about me in Houston. This doesn't happen in Waco. This was me in my school in Houston. Before I brought in that college readiness system I know of as AVID, you could have come to my school, and if, if we, all we had was time to go in one class, just one, I would have said, okay, um, let's go into AP Calculus. You would have come out of there saying, wow, you let me see one class? That class was on the ball. Those kids are going to college. Those kids were, wow, I was excited to be in there. But you would have looked at me and you would have said, well, Patrick, I didn't know your school was 100% white and Asian. It wasn't, but we were allowing that. Because in my school too, if all I let you see, we had one chance to go in one class and I took you into my in-school suspension room, you would have said, ooh, that's a hot mess. Those kids, I said, ooh, they in trouble. And then you would have looked at me and said, Patrick, I didn't know that your school was a, like a charter school for boys of color. It wasn't. But our system was allowing that, and I realized that quickly. Culture, culture of a campus, culture of a campus, culture is what do you allow? And we were allowing different opportunities. Because I had great teachers like you when I went to Prairie View A&M University, and the English professor said, okay, write this paper. I was like, please, because I went to a great high schools like you have, I had the opportunity to write papers like that. I looked at that professor and I said, please, I got you. I didn't say that in my mind. I said, I got you. And I wrote that paper and got an A. Kids that were much smarter than I will ever be raised their hands and said, professor, I don't know what you're talking about. You want us to write what, how, when, where, who? And what they were really saying is, Professor, nobody ever gave me the opportunity to do that type of work in my pre-K through 12 experience. And they started dropping like flies. They were much more intelligent than I will ever be. Great teachers like you made sure I had the opportunity to be college ready. So your biggest gap is there's no achievement gap, there's an opportunity gap. Second gap, the expectation gap. What do we expect to be college and career ready? Not y'all, let me take you back to Houston. Because if you had looked at that AP calculus in that in-school suspension room, 
you would have seen a different set of expectations for students. We expected one group to do well, go on to college. We didn't expect it from the other group. And let me tell you, in my school, AP wasn't full of the smartest kids. It was full of the most compliant. Those who could sit still and not move for 50 minutes were rewarded with college and career readiness. In school, suspension was full of geniuses. But they weren't given that same opportunity. And we didn't have that expectation. There are no learning gaps in our children. We have to close those opportunity gaps. So your mission, you can see it up there. I love, love, love what you're doing and what you do here for kids. And I love what your leaders have said. And, and we're talking about, y'all need to get, you know, and it got quiet. Your, your superintendent said, you know, our schools are meeting the, the standard. And y'all were just like, okay. Let me keep it real for you. <laughs> I get to travel this state. That's not happening everywhere. You all need to realize how good and special you are for what you are doing for kids. When the superintendent says that your more schools are meeting the standard, that doesn't happen by accident. It's because of great educators and great work done by great educators and teachers and every staff that has the opportunity to touch a kid. I love your mission. Your mission said all students. I also got excited when I saw your strategic goal. When you look at your strategic goals, which are straight on your website, anybody can pull them up. All students, all learners, all students. Whoa, I got excited. And then I looked at your commitments. And you said, every student. Oh, and you talked about equity and excellence. That's my baby. That's my research area. So I got really excited. Your core beliefs, who you are in your gut. I got really excited. All students shall reach their full potential. All students should graduate college or workforce ready. Whoa, so my theme for this morning, does all mean all? Thank you, Urshus. Some of y'all, let's move on. Does all mean, I'm gonna open the altar in a little bit. Does all mean all? Because when we look at the definition of college readiness, what is college readiness? David Connolly is your go-to guru. He literally wrote the book on college and career readiness. You can see his definition is really simple. Can a kid go to college without the need for remediation? You know, in Texas, we send half our kids to college taking a remedial course, a developmental course. Do they have to pay for those courses? <gasps> Wait a minute. So if they have to pay for those courses, that means they do count towards the chemistry degree they were hoping for, right? Half of them pay for classes that will never count. 91% of them who sit in reading quit that semester. That's why his definition becomes critical for us as educators. Can a kid go without remediation? Because I had great educators like you, I went to Prairie View and didn't need remediation. And like statistically, because you had given me the opportunity to take advanced courses, finish Prairie View in less than four years. I'm not a genius, you can statistically do that for all kids. Because when we look at what's happening in Texas, this just breaks down, and this is from the Lumina report. Lumina Foundation does a great report every year. Breaks it down by state and region and county. This is for our state. And when we look at our working age adults, we can see at the top, less than ninth grade, about 8% of Texans. Ninth grade, but didn't finish high school, about 9% of Texans. Finished high school about a quarter, and that's it. So you can see the vast majority of people walking this country don't have the piece of paper you have called a bachelor's degree. It's not because they're not smart. It's because of that opportunity and expectation gap. And when we break it down by race, it starts to look much worse. And so we talk about an achievement gap, and what I say is when I look at those statistics, I see where I should be. But great educators like you took seriously the notion of closing the opportunity and expectation gap. Because here's where that sense of urgency comes for me. There are only six things our babies can do when they leave us. When I look at all these babies over here, I'm sorry I'm calling you babies, that's just where I'm from. 
When I look at these great children over here, there's only six things they can do when they leave you. Everybody in the world is currently doing one of these six. Everybody who ever lived on this planet is currently doing one of those six. Everybody in China is doing one of those six. Everybody in Afghanistan is doing one of those six. There are only six things we can do when we leave formal schooling. Number one, you can go to school. You can go to college. You can go to two-year school, a certificate program, technical school, all great choices. Can I do number one if I don't finish high school? It's not going to happen. But I still have five other choices. <laughs> number two, great choice. You can go to the military. Can I do that if I don't finish high school? Not in this country. Oh, but I still have four other choices. And you start to see what starts to happen for our babies. Because number three, you can go to work. Great choice. I want you to be college and or career ready. Am I going to be making $2 million straight out of high school? Legally? Which, which leads to number five. Number four, you can be unemployed. You can sit at home with mama and them. Not in my house, but I heard it can be done. Which leads to poor choices, poor decisions. Number five, incarceration. And our country is the best on the planet at incarcerating people. It's a business, let's be clear. Same thing, like the news media are a business. I don't care about informing you. Oh, I was going to stop for a culturally relevant teaching moment. I'm going to keep going, because I got about nine minutes. <laughs> I'm going to go there. <laughs> Black folks, can I give away some of our secrets? So, uh, so, so black secret number one, I have to ask for permission. Ooh, black secret number two, we have to have a quorum, and we have met it, okay? Ooh, black secret number three, Al Sharpton don't speak for all of us. Okay, now black folks get nervous. See, y'all get, y'all know black rule number one, I got my permission. Black rule number four, most of us believe OJ did it. We're not going to tell you that. Black folks getting real nervous. Ooh, black secret number five. Half the time, half, half, 50% of the time, half. I do not get change from the store placed in my hand. Half the time, most of the time. Okay, wait a minute, it got a little quiet. Hmm. Yeah, y'all talk about what, what are you talking about? It's two thousand. What? Huh? If you know what I'm talking about and you've experienced this, would you just stand right quickly? Look at the demographics. It's 2015. I didn't get together with all these black folks and say, "Okay, I'm gonna say something." And I need y'all to stand. <laughs> no, they know what I'm talking about. I could spend the rest of this speech telling you different things that happened to me solely because I am blessed to be this color. I got, I'm followed in the mall. I can be dressed like this. They're going to follow me around. Can I help you? No, you can't help me. Can I help you? No, you can't help me. And then finally, this is what always happens. They come over, sir, the clearance rack is in the back. Now, see, I really wanted the clearance rack, but now I can't go. And so finally, when I've had enough of that, I'm like, why y'all following me around, huh? And then I'm the angry black man walking out in cups. <laughs> and I don't drop that baggage at the schoolhouse door. 12-year-old Patrick experienced that. Seven-year-old Patrick experienced all of that. So I didn't drop it at the schoolhouse door. I needed educators to say to me, I respect you for who you are, where you come from, and where you're going, and you're going to college, bruh. I'm going to give you the opportunity to go. 
I'm going to give you the opportunity for some honors classes, and I'm going to expect you to do it. And the only reason I'm standing on this stage today is because great educators like you closed the two real gaps that really caused that number four, five, and six. It's the opportunity gap, because I got great friends in jail, great people in prison, bad choices, great people. And I go visit them and they be like, Patrick, you, you know what, you're so much better than us. You know what, we, we, we wish we were like you. And I say, stop it. We were raised together. I am no different from you and I am definitely not better than you. The only difference I am on this side of the bars is because I had great teachers like the ones in this room who closed my opportunity and expectation gap, period. And the sixth option is death. But everybody on this planet is currently doing one of those. Everybody who ever was on this planet is currently doing one of those. Our job as educators is to say, we got six opportunities. I want you to have all six available to you because guess what? If they have all six available, they're gonna take number one. Because when I go visit my cousins and them in prison, they don't look at me and say, you know number five was always my choice. <laughs> that, you know, that, that's why I always, please. They have number five because you saw how number one, two, and three start slowly slipping off the tables and there are only six things they can do. Because what I wanna make sure that we do is to make sure they understand that the lifetime income starts to double and triple based on education. I can also double and triple your chances of being uh, employed just by being college and career ready. I can make sure you're happier. Look at y'all, y'all happy. Because you got insurance, you probably took a little vacation, everybody can't do that. That is directly linked to your choice to take number one, which is directly linked to the opportunity and expectation that you had. So back to my question, does all mean all? Because as that first year teacher, that was me. I thought I had to be equal, because I wanted to be fair. So I would teach kids. I'm going to give you a box for photosynthesis. Stand on it so you can see the game. The objective here is to see the game. Brother number one on the left, yay, I can see the game. I'm successful with the objective. Brother number two in the middle, yay, I can see the game. I'm, a, uh, I'm, I'm successful with the objective. Brother number three on the end, I knew he was going to be looking at the fence when I gave him the box. But I wanted to be fair. Fair and equal are two different things. They never have been the same. Because think about it, we're the only profession that does this. If this brother here, if I'm, if I'm a doctor, and you come on in to equal law office, <laughs> excuse me, equal doctor's office, and you got Ebola, whoo, you in trouble. And this sister sitting next to you, you, you have a little cut on your arm, you're just concerned about it. And the sister sitting next to you, uh, she had a hip replacement. Well, this is equal doctor's office. I want to be fair. So I'm going to give all three of you a Band-Aid. She going to be all right in the middle. Two of y'all going to be looking at the fence. I'm equal law office. I'm a lawyer. Equal law office. You on trial for murder and got Ebola. You in trouble. You got a speeding ticket. And they say you robbed the stove. I'm sorry, sister. That's what you get for sitting in front. I wouldn't, as your lawyer, say, well, I got to be fair. I got to be equal. So why don't you all just plead guilty? This is going to work out for you with the speeding ticket. Two of y'all going to be looking at the fence or looking at the bars. So my goal is what we call and this is straight out of your strategic goals. That's the reason why I started shouting when I read it. Equity. One of your goals is equity and excellence. What does each child need to be successful? I'm going to give each kid what he or she needs to be able to achieve the objective. I'm not going to apologize for treating people differently because we already do that because we understand fair and equal are two different things. Think about it, you got a kid on an IEP that says he gets note-taking assistance, does he get it? By law, he better. <laughs> and then I'm a kid in your class, and I, why he get those notes? What are you gonna tell me? Because I said so. <laughs> <laughs> and 
And so I start to get to assign the reason why you're treating me differently. And remember, seven-year-old Patrick had things happen to him in the world that makes it real easy for me to assign a certain reason. That's another workshop. Let's move on. So equity and excellence is one of your charges. Because I want to raise the achievement of every kid, but at the same time, I want to narrow the gaps. Our goal is that equity and excellence. And I'm so excited to be here because I know you're about raising the achievement of every kid, narrowing the gaps, eliminating predictability. Not y'all, but in Houston, shame on us. If this was me back in Houston, before I have it especially, and I said, okay, we're going to see babies in a, in, in a week, could you all tell me which student group would do the worst on STAR and EOC this year. Before we've seen one child, before we've instructed one child, my faculty could have predicted it. And we'd have been right. If we can predict something and allow it to happen, shame on us. But eliminating predictability is what equity is about. If I see that baby, I say, if I give him this box, he's gonna be looking at the fence. I need to do the equity work, and I'm so excited that that's one of your goals. Eliminating predictability and giving kids a high predictability of success. My time is up. I appreciate y'all. Thank y'all so much for having me. Follow me on Twitter. I'm tweeting some great stuff. Let me put that back up. But let me just say on behalf of the citizens of Region 12, the citizens of Waco, the Avid College Readiness System, Thank you so much for who you are, what you choose to do. Thank you so much for choosing this profession. Thank you for everything you're going to do this year. I'm so excited about what you are going to do. Congratulations, welcome back, and thank you for what you're gonna do for these kids. I appreciate you.